Hi, I'm Brian Holt, a product manager at Stripe, and welcome to Intermediate React version 5. I created this course to introduce you to the tools and techniques needed to write production-ready React applications. And this course will cover advanced React techniques like code splitting, server-side rendering, testing, and transitions, as well as tools like Tailwind, TypeScript, and Redux. I hope you enjoy the course. 42 kilobytes to get React DOM, and then React is about itself 2.5 kilobytes, so altogether just under 45 kilobytes. If you are trying to keep your performance budget under 100 kilobytes for your, that initial page load, you probably need to do code splitting. So code splitting is the idea that you, need, you just load the bare minimum necessary code to get your app up and running so the user sees something immediately, and then you hurry in the background and you load everything else. You need some sort of strategy to be able to split things out. Luckily for us, React and Vite work together really well to make that happen for you. By the way, I'm not implying that you have to have a code budget of 100 kilobytes, but you should have a, like a size budget of something for your application. Something that you're trying to stay under or some performance timing you're trying to hit, you should be thinking about what's a reasonable amount of time that it takes me for my app to load in front of my user. And it's going to differ by your app, your users, um, those kind of things. Like if you're writing code that calls, you know, it's like Uber for helicopters, they probably have a nice phone, they're probably on a decent connection, you can probably have a pretty high performance budget. If you are writing something that keeps track of, you know, a farmer that's watering their crops, frequently out in the boonies they have terrible 2G connection, whether that's in rural South Dakota or in India or Australia, right? They're going to have bad reception, so your performance budget is very sensitive. Things like this become very helpful. So what we're going to do is we're going to start splitting things off of our main package. So let's go to app.jsx. And up here where we import React, right here, please import use state lazy and suspense with a capital S. Okay, I want you to delete details and search params, the imports here. We're going to split off our various different routes from our app so that it's only loading the, uh, the route the user is loading. So I'm going to say const details equals lazy, and then you give it a function, import dot slash details. Same thing for search params. So whoop, details equals lazy, and then a function that return, returns import details. And search params, lazy import search params. If you are not familiar with import, this is a function that's built into JavaScript, right? So it's a built-in function. That's why we're not importing it or anything like that. And this works like require used to for CommonJS. These are static imports at the top, as in these are not dynamic but import is dynamic import for ES6 modules, which is what require was for CommonJS. So this is saying if, some, if something tries to render details, panic and load details. Veet is smart enough to look at that and say, hey, this is not required on the initial page load. I'm not going to load it right away. Okay. And then now we end up with these details and these search params uh, components, and these will not actually load until their route is actually loaded. Does that make sense? So we, we need to tell it, OK, we're going to load this later, but what happens when we hit something that we need to load? We're going to do that with suspense. So inside your query client provider, Put a component here called suspense. And that'll wrap everything inside of query client provider. 
And then we need to tell it what the fallback is. If something inside of this is loading, what do we do? Well, we're going to show just like a nice little a loading pane. Uh, with a h2 class name equals, I, put whatever emoji you want in here. This is the loader. I have just a spiral here, but feel free to put whatever emoji you want to put in there. If you want to have a loading dog, that, that's actually, let's do that. Let's, that'll be cute. We'll put a dog, and then we'll have like a spinning dog head. So that's what suspense does. It basically says like, hey, if you hit this high up in the render tree and something is loading, show the fallback until the suspense has returned. And I need to restart my app. npm run dev. Notice when I load, load the page just for a very split second, it's all local host, so everything's going really fast. But you probably even missed it because I missed it. Let's just put this for a second on fast 3G and refresh the page. You can see the spinning dog for a second, and then it loads all those components in the background. Go install the Redux dev tools. I left a link here for Firefox and for Chrome. I think I have to go install it for Chrome, so let me go do that really quick. So I'm going to click Add to Chrome here. OK, that's been added here. And now if I refresh my page, I should have in here Redux uh, Redux pane. So I'm going to click on that. This is probably one of the other most co uh, compelling parts about uh, Redux, is I can actually see everything happening inside of my Redux via this, right? So right now I'm looking at all the actions that are coming in. You can see all of these various different actions that are coming in from Pet API. These are generated by Redux Toolkit. So let's say I change this to be dog, that's going to dispatch an action. Actually, it won't. Oh, will it? It does. OK, here we go. Oh, yeah, because it, it's changing the breed. So it executes uh, that, and you see fulfilled, and I can see all the various different actions coming in, right? And if I click Submit, you can see it calls search params all. Then it does unsubscribing and pending and fulfilled and a bunch of stuff like that. But you can see step by step of what's going on. What's cool about this, though, is I can start stepping back in time. Because all every, what it's doing is it's basically just like reapplying or unapplying all these various different actions. So if I go back here, I can actually click play, and it'll just go at a rate, and I can watch you know, things playing out in my uh, uh, tra time traveling debugging is what that's called. I can always go in and I can see, uh, I can re you know reset things. I can see what the actions looked like. So you can see what was in the payload. This gives me a bunch of meta information of like when did it happen, what was the query, what were the arguments, what was the request ID, did it work, did it not work. Um, one of my favorite things here, so let's go look at one of them that we created, like the search params all one that I did, this one. First of all, you can do things like jump to this one. You can also say, hey, what would happen if this action didn't happen? You can click skip, and it'll reapply everything and skip that action. It's kind of interesting, right? Um, and then another thing here, I can click test. It'll actually generate a test for me that I can just copy and paste into my code, which is pretty, pretty cool. I like when my tools write tests for me, right? Now, I'm going to argue this is a ridiculous test. Look at how much stuff it's trying to put into my test. But it's a good starter, right? This is a Jest template, but there's one for Mocha and Tape and Ava. We're about to do vtest for our testing framework. Just use the just one if you're doing vtest. Uh, there's the state. There's the difference. You can see like what was the delta between the two. So I went from animal to being nothing to being dog. And you can see the actual uh, stack trace to see what led you to calling to that. I've not found a use for that, but that's pretty cool. 
Uh, and that's it. So one thing that I have seen people do, which I found very interesting and a compelling use case of what the Redux toolkit can do for you, or just in general Redux, let's say your user's application crashes, right? What I've seen people do is dump their entire like history of Redux, and then they'll sell it, send it off to Track.js or Sentry or something like that. You can then take that dump and you can put it into your dev tools and you can literally go piece by piece of what your user did to cause the crash. So you can literally like time travel through your user crashing their application. Pretty cool, right? Pretty, pretty compelling uh, debugging tools. So the way that you want to do like a, a migration from a JSX to a TSX uh, code base is you just say everything that is not in uh, a, that does not have a TSX file is not strictly checked, right? So well, I'm going to go here into modal.jsx, and I'm just going to modify this from JSX to TSX, right? And then all of a sudden I'm going to start getting a ton of errors here of like, hey, you need to fix this, right? Okay, so it, I'm just getting a bunch of TypeScript errors here. It's like, hey, uh, HTML div element is not assignable to type null. These are all good errors for us to have. So let's just start piece by piece going through this. I'm going to re re react there because we're not using it. Use effect, use ref. Um, we're going to import mutable object ref and react element from here. And that all looks good. We're going to say that children here are, they are React elements. Oh, that's a return type. No, 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 actually what we wanted there. Inside here, rather. Okay, so the first thing we're going to say here is these children coming in from, as properties, they're going to be React elements. And React elements is basically anything that React can render, which is going to be something of either a JSX type, it could be a null, it could be a bunch of stuff like that. So now we know if you mouse over children, we know that for a fact this is a React element, which is cool. Okay, next thing we're going to say is this lref here is going to be a mutable ref object, which we have up here, right? But we're going to tell it what type of thing it's going to contain, and it's either going to contain an HTML div object, sorry, HTML div element, or you can see here we instantiate with null, so we have to say or this is null. Okay, and then now if I mouse over lref, I can see that it's either an HTML div or it's a null. And so that means here, that's what I have to do this check here, and now you can see here that um, every time that I refer to lref.current, I can be guaranteed every single time after this point that it's, it's going to be an HTML div element, which is great. Cool. OK, let's go down to our use effect here. Uh, first thing we're going to say here is um, every time that you query the DOM for here from get element by ID, it can give you back null, right? In theory, if the, if the um, HTML doesn't have a uh, modal element, what is modal root going to be? It's going to be null. So we have to be kind of defensive about that. So we're going to say if uh, modal root or no lref.current then here we're just going to say return, right? If, if either one of those doesn't exist anymore, then we're going to be just say like, okay, well, no, we, we're not going to do that. Now I'm guaranteed here that modal root is definitely an HTML element because if it was null, it would not get past this point. So that's why that works. Here we have to, again, be a little bit more defensive here in this return function here. So we just have to say if there is, if there is no modal root, or rather, if there is no lref.current. Then 
uh, sorry, if there is, then go ahead and remove it. There we go. OK. And now, this modal.tsx looks good. So all of these like if statements, you're going to find here this is a very common theme, with uh, particularly when you're porting an old like a JavaScript type, uh, code base where you can be kind of loose and uh, with your types, right? Like uh, here, I, I wasn't being defensive about modal root never being there because I, I literally wrote the HTML that has it there, so I'm not really concerned about it being removed, right? So that therefore I was not very defensive about it. But TypeScript is going to be make you be very precise about like. Nope, we have to provide for all of the cases because we do not allow runtime errors like that. Okay.